All right. So today I want to talk about Jesus being the firstborn. And it was funny because when I was thinking about the message title this morning, it was like I kept feeling that Satan has no say because Jesus was the firstborn. You know, when you think of uh, like a big brother or sister, right? Anybody got older siblings in here? When you have like a big brother or sister, it's like you can't tell them nothing, right? Because they've had the experience in life already. You know, they came first. They have that sense of entitlement. So if you're a younger brother, if you look to an older brother or sister and try and tell them something, they're going to be like, you don't know nothing. I'm older than you and so on and so on. But the thing about this is that Jesus is not Satan's brother, you know, but the sense is that Jesus came first. And with Jesus being first, Satan can't tell him nothing because Jesus is first in priority. And, you know, Satan might be the prince of the power of the air, but I thank God that we serve Jesus, who has a position above a prince, who is the king of kings. And if you think about it for you guys as well, Jesus tells us in Revelation that you are also kings and priests. So you even have a position over Satan, him being the prince of the power of the air. Even you have position above Satan as a king. Amen. So the um, scripture we're going to be out of today is Colossians 1 verses 15 through 18. Colossians 1 15 through 18. And it says, who is the image of the invisible God? The firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All of these things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, which is the church, who is the beginning and he is also the firstborn of the dead. That is all things he might have preeminent. So the first thing I want to talk about first is the firstborn of every creature, right? The first part of the scripture says that God is the image. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does that word image mean? That word image means he's a perfect replica. So Jesus is a perfect replica of the invisible God. We know that the Trinity has three parts. It has the Father, it has the Son, and it has the Holy Spirit. But Jesus came, the Son came, and took on flesh, but was still fully God, right? So when Jesus came to earth and took on this, this as Elena would say, this meat suit, you know, as he came in flesh, he took on um, our nature as a man, but he was still fully God, right? He had every attribute as God, because even Colossians 2.9 says, in Jesus dwelt the Godhead bodily. So that means all of the power that the Father had, when Jesus came to the earth, God downloaded all that power into him. But also, aside from him having every power of God, he also had every attribute as us as a man, so that he was able to empathize with us and was able to take on our sin in place of us. So when we hear the word firstborn, we think of somebody that was born first, right? But like I said earlier, it doesn't mean being born literally. When the, the word firstborn, the, the, um, the meaning of that word means to have um, rank and to be first in position. Because we know John 3, 16 says, um, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that, who shall, that whosoever shall believe on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So he was the only begotten son of God. He was the only son that came from God. Because us as sons of God, we were begotten by the word. But, God, but Jesus was the only one that was begotten of God the Father. So that's why he is the firstborn of creation because he was the one that came straight out of the father's loins. He came out of God's seed. If God had a seed, it would have went right into Jesus, right? So he's the only begotten son. So when we hear the word firstborn, it means that he's first in rank. Just like Adriana in our church, what do we call her? We call her first lady, right? And it's not because she's been the first lady, she's the first lady ever born in this world, but because she is connected 
to our pastor. So because she's connected to our pastor, she has the rank as first lady in our church. And it's the same with Jesus because Jesus has the ultimate connection with our heavenly father. He inherits all of creation and he has the right to rule as such as it says here in this scripture that he has, um, that for him were all things created and by him all things were created. So we, we even see in Hebrews um, chapter one, verse two, that has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom, whom he has appointed heir of all things by whom also he was made all the world. So saying all that, I know that was a, a mouthful, but Jesus is the firstborn of all creation because of the connection that he has with the heavenly father. So him coming straight from the father that gives him rank as the firstborn of all creation. So we also know, we can also look at it from a different perspective than that. When in Genesis 1, 1 through 3, he was the firstborn of all creation. Why? Genesis 1, 1 through 3 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, right? And then this is the scripture and God said, let there be light and there was light, right? So we see that the first thing, when God saw that there was darkness over the earth, the first thing that God did was he said, let there be light or translation, we all know that says light be, right? Who is that light? We all know that 2 Corinthians 4, chapter 6 says that the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ was the faith of that light was the face of Jesus that, heart, that shines into the heart of man. So we know that that light is the glory of God through the face of Jesus. So when there was darkness, the first thing that God called forward was light, which was the face of Jesus, which was Jesus, right? So this does not mean that Jesus did not exist. It just means that when, G when God said light be, he was calling Jesus to manifest his glory that was already there. He was just calling Jesus to manifest the glory of God through his face. So this means that everything now, because Jesus was the first thing that God called to manifest, because Jesus was the first thing, that means that now everything that comes after him now has to come in subjection to his power and his authority since he is first in rank, being him being the firstborn of all creation. So the great thing about a firstborn too, in Jewish culture, the firstborn son of a man, he gets a double portion of all of his father's inheritance compared to all the other children. So if we look at this as Jesus being the firstborn of all creation, and God says that we are joint heirs with Christ, that means that we can have a double portion of God's anointing on our life, right? We hear about the scriptures in Joel, that there's a springtime in the harvest, and we hear about the former and the latter rain. This is all the double portion of God that we are going to receive in this end time because we are one with Christ. So this is why it's so important that we are joint heirs. But how do we become joint heirs with Christ? We have to be, when you're a joint heir, that means that you are fully immersed in God's presence. That means that you are one with God, just like a married man and woman. When they have that intimacy, they become one flesh. And that's the same thing with us and Jesus. We can become one with Christ by being fully immersed in him. But that means us not only being partakers of his glory, but it also means us being partakers of his suffering. And through the suffering, the glory is produced, and then we can receive a double portion of God's anointing. And even when Jesus spoke to the, um, the Jewish people, they asked, where is the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, it is within you. So because the kingdom of God is within you, that does not mean only the kingdom is in you, but everything that's in that kingdom is also within you, right? So we have access to everything that God has to offer to us because he's the firstborn, because all things are consistent of him, all things were created for him, and all things are created by him. That means that when you have Jesus in you, all the attributes of that kingdom are also within you as well. And you have access to it 
but you only get access to it through an intimacy with God, right? You know, uh, Romans 14, 17 says that the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. So those are the things that you possess, possess within you. You possess righteousness within you. You, you possess joy within you and you possess peace in you. But, and you have access to those things, but you can only gain access. What did pastor tell us yesterday? If you have the key, right? And who is the key? The key is Jesus. So the more that you get closer to God, the more that you gain that intimacy with God, the kingdom that's within you, God will give you the keys to unlock those doors and those opportunities and those blessings that are already within you. Amen. So the scripture says that for by him, all things are created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So for by him, all things were created, right? John 1, 1 verses, John 1 verses 1 through 4 says, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was anything made, wait, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of man. So in the beginning was the word, right? So we know that it was the word that brought all these things forward, right? So people think that Jesus was created. But if this scripture here is saying that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, the same was beginning with God. All things were made by him, right? So if this is saying in the beginning, God would just existed already, how can we believe that God was, that Jesus was created? In this scripture here, we see that Jesus is the uncreated creator, right? So Jesus was never created. He was always, as long as God existed is as long Jesus existed because he was the son of God, right? So God, Jesus was in his, in his father. So this scripture here shows that in the beginning was the word. So in the beginning, Jesus already was, was created. He was already with his father. Because even in John chapter one, it says the word would became flesh and dwelt among us. So if the word was always existed from the beginning, that also means that Jesus always existed. So when the word was present, you know, and from the beginning, Jesus was present as well. So if we say that Jesus was was present from the beginning with God. You know, a lot of time, and, and if Jesus was with God from the beginning and they created everything, right? A lot of times we will ask, you know, if all things were created by God and all things were created by Jesus, did God create evil? You know, that's a question that I think we all have at times. Did God create um, evil? And the answer would have to be yes. Because if the scripture says that all things were created by him and for him, evil is under that category of all, right? So if evil is under that category of all, that means that God and Jesus would have had to create evil, right? Now, was evil intended by God? No, that's where free will came in, right? God loved us so much that he created us knowing that we could very well rebel against him, but that was the greatest act of love. Because one thing that Pastor Blaine has taught us and has stuck with me is that forced love is not true love. If you really love somebody, you cannot force them to love you back. And that's the thing with God. God loved us so much that he would not be a dictator. He would not be somebody that would force you to love him back but he created you with the sense that you could choose if you wanted to serve him or not. So because God created all of us with that purpose, that's how, that's how evil came into the picture because God created us to be good, but because of our free will and we allow iniquity to come into our hearts like Satan did, now that's how evil became present. So God did create evil because he created us with free will, but he never intended evil. 
And the thing is, is that God has to take credit for creating evil because that now means that he has dominion over it to destroy it, right? He can take credit for it so that now he can have the power to destroy it. Because if he didn't take credit for evil, then he wouldn't have the power to destroy it. And we also see two scenarios. I'm not gonna go really deep into this because we could definitely break this down. But if you want an example of if God created evil, you can look at 1 Corinthians 21, I'm not 1 Corinthians, 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 24 tell the same story. And it's when Israel was having to fight and they got scared and David had numbered the people instead of trusting God to take care of his army. And if you look in 1 Chronicles 21, verse one says that Satan stood against Israel and moved David to number the people. But if you look in 2 Samuel 24, it says the Lord's anger kindled against Israel and it moved David to number the people. So these are the same two stories, but one of the stories says that Satan moved David to number the people. And then the second story says that God moved David to number the people. So we can know that it could have been Satan very well then moved David through doubt and unbelief to number the people, right? But because God is in control and God created all things, he had to take credit for David numbering the people so that God could come and swoop in and save them from their destruction. So that's the same thing for us, right? We can't blame God for the evil that's happening in our lives, but we can shift the perspective and say, you know what? God allowed this for a certain reason. And because God allowed it, I can trust him now that he's going to save me from it right? Because if we sit here and say, Satan's doing this to us, Satan's doing this to me, Satan's doing this, Satan, you're giving glory to Satan. And now when you give glory to Satan, there's no room for God to move in and save you from that situation. But if you change the perspective and say, you know what, God, you created all things. You knew that this was going to happen. I'm going to sit here and not blame you, God, for this, but I'm going to say, you know what, God, I know you allowed this for a certain purpose. So you know what, God, I'm going to sit here and rejoice and, and take joy in you allowing it so that you can work something out in me. You can come and save me from this. And now it'll turn around and I'll have a deeper level of intimacy with you. Because at the end of the day, God is going to get glory from everything. The Bible says here in this scripture that for from all things were created and by him and to him all things were created. So if all things were created for him, that means that he's going to get glory from all of creation, right? At the end of the day, God is going to get glory, even from Satan, he's going to have to get glory. Even from the devils in hell, he's going to have to get glory because the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. Right? A lot of times we'll say, well, how can Satan serve God and worship God? Let me tell you, at the end of the day, every creation will bow, whether it be now here on earth. When we have free will, we can choose now to bow to God and confess him to be Lord or on judgment day, we are going to bow and confess him to be Lord. Because I don't care who you are. You can be the most evil man in the world. And when you meet the God of heaven and earth, you're going to realize how much you messed up and you're going to bow and give him glory. And you're going to want to get into the, that kingdom, but it may be too late because you did not choose to do it here on earth. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how evil is present in this earth. God is going to get all of the glory, right? Because what does the Bible even say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but a principalities, powers, spiritual weakness in high places and rulers of darkness in Ephesians 6, 12, right? But if we look in Colossians 2, 15, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. So principalities and powers, Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers 
and made a public example of them by triumphing over them by hanging on their cross. By Jesus hanging on that cross, the principalities, the powers, the rulers of darkness, the spiritual wickedness in high places, all those things that were designed by Satan to destroy you, by Jesus hanging on that cross, he showed, he, he basically put them to an open shame, triumphing over them, knowing that he was going to raise, rise up again and destroy them. Because this scripture here in Colossians even says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. This could be demonic thrones or godly thrones. This could be demonic um, dominions or godly dominions. It could be demonic principalities or godly principalities and so on. Whether they be evil or good, they were all created initially to give God glory. And at the end of their, at the end of their road, they will give God glory at the end of the day. So we know that God is the firstborn of all creation, right? And the thing is, is that God will always get glory, you know? Proverbs 16, 4 even says, the Lord has made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. This is what the word says. Proverbs 16 says that God even made the wicked for the day of evil. And if we look at this scripture, it, it's a scripture of sovereignty. It's a scripture that is, ex, is showing God as the example of being all powerful. Because listen, God can do whatever he wants with what he created. And he shares here that he made the wicked for the day of evil. He will use evil to bring calamity on themselves, showing those who chose wickedness will not go without punishment, right? It shows us here that evil and unrighteousness cannot escape the hand of God. You know, a lot of times we will go through life and we have to forgive those who hurt us. We have to love those that hate us and all these things that we wonder in our hearts. Will God repay us for our good deeds? You know, those, that person that raped your child that refuses to change. You, you wonder in your head, oh, is God going to pay us back for what harm these people have caused us? This is what God is showing us here. In this scripture, it's a scripture of sovereignty that even in the in the wicked, he created the wicked for the day of evil. Those that chose to not serve God will have judgment at the end of the day. And this is why the Bible says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We don't have to worry about those people that have hurt us. We don't have to worry about those people that have harmed us. We can take joy in knowing that all things were created by him and all things were created for him. So if all things were created by him, that enemy that you have was created by God. So that means that God can, can prove you and, and, and give vengeance on your behalf without you even lifting a finger because they were created by him. So you can take joy in knowing that God will always have your back. And he created these things. So that means that he can bring vengeance upon those things on your behalf even, right? And he can make you and render you as holy. You know, our job is not to wish calamity on anybody. We want to make sure we're praying for people and make sure that because every soul is precious. I don't care how evil you are. Every soul is precious. And we want to pray that God will save everybody. But if people refuse to change, you will know that God will have, you know, vengeance. And God will, will get, let me tell you, can't nobody get you back better than God. You know, I always say that. That's why I'm like, you don't have to worry about trying to, gossip about somebody, retaliate, retaliate against somebody, God will always have your back. The Bible says, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. You do not have to worry. God will always have your back, you know? So even, even the evil God has created for the day of the wicked. So, and another scripture, if you want to know that God created evil, Isaiah 54, 16 through 17. This is the one that I always point people to. Behold, I have created the smith that blows the coals in the fire and that brings forth the instrument for his work. And I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment shall be condemned. This is the heritage 
of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. So this scripture says that the, the, the smith that blows coil, that Satan that blows forth his fire, God created that, right? But even though God created Satan, that smith that blows, and the, God created the waster to destroy, on the flip side, God says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So that means because Jesus created the waster, that means that he can prevent the waster from harming you because he created the waster. So because he created Satan, he can prevent Satan from harming you any further. All right. All right, I got a couple more and then I'll grab you. All right. Let me just finish up real quick for the recording. So we know that. OK, so going on to the next part of the scripture in him, all things consist. OK, so the word here consists means to hold together. Right. So the scripture says um, Colossians, I believe it's 17 or 16. Um, and he is before all things and by him all things consist. Right. That mean that word consists means to hold together like glue. So by him, all things are holding together. You know, the reasons that the planets stay in orbit is because God is holding them together, right? The reason why um, you are breathing today is because God has given you breath in your body, basically. You know, the reason why you have a sound mind and you're not mentally ill or going crazy is because God has, God is holding you together. You know, the reason why we, God is not, and even the Bible said it's because of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. Because we are not, the reason why we're not consumed is because of God's mercy. It's because God is holding us together. So if God can hold the planets together, listen, he can certainly handle your situation. And you don't ever have to worry that God is going to leave you hanging or God is going to sit here and destroy you. Because that's not who God is, you know? And I just love that before we move on to the firstborn of the dead, I just love that, that he's the firstborn of all creation. So that gives me hope to know that death, hell, and the grave cannot, it cannot touch me. Because God created death, hell, and the grave, right? And when Satan lost those keys, you know, when, G, when, P, when Adam lost those keys, you know, this message goes right along with what Pastor Blaine talked about yesterday. You know, God created all of these things, you know? And death, hell, and the grave, God had in his hand, right? And Adam had those keys that it would not have dominion over him. But he lost those keys. When, and the keys of the kingdom he lost when he was kicked out of the garden. But I thank God that now he's the firstborn of the dead and he took back those keys. You know, now we're going on to the, I mean, I didn't even realize how much this really ties into Pastor Blaine's message from yesterday. But now that God, Jesus took back the keys, he took back the keys because he's the firstborn of the dead now, right? He is the head of the body, verse 18 says the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead. That is all things that he may have preeminence. So him being the firstborn of the dead means that he has put the down payment on our resurrection. He has put by his blood and him hanging on that cross and dying, he, him being the firstborn of the dead is our down payment that we're going to cash in one day for our resurrection. Since Jesus died and rose again from the dead, you can have confidence that you're going to, when you die, you're going to rise again as well. And, and the thing is, is that this is spiritual and physical. We were all spiritually dead at one point. We were all working according to the ways of the world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the Bible says, right? So because we were all once dead, when Jesus comes into our life, now we have breath, right? Because he's the firstborn of the dead. So now we have that resurrection spiritually, which we all have. We all have Jesus in our hearts, and now we're all resurrected spiritually. But also, this is also physically. If we die and go to the grave before the rapture, we have hope that one day when the Bible says that um, be not ignorant concerning those that are asleep, right? 
The Bible says that when that trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those who remain and alive will be caught up in the air with those in the cloud. So we know that when we die, you know, we're dust and whatever, when dust to dust, whatever, we go back to the grave. But we have that hope that we're going to rise again. And when Jesus raises us from the dead, we're going to have that glorified body again. Our body is going to be resurrected. And now we're going to have that glorified body that's going to meet our soul and our spirit again with God, right? So the thing is, is that we have hope that since Jesus awoke from the dead, so shall we, but not only us. You have that hope too, that your family members can resurrect again because he was the firstborn of the dead. You have that hope that your friends can be resurrected. You have that hope that that person that even betrayed you can be resurrected again, all because Jesus was the firstborn of the dead, right? Because he died and he resurrected and took on that, took that place of death for us. We don't have to die anymore. So he was the firstborn of creation, meaning everything is in subjection to him. And every power, principality, whatever it is on this earth, dominion, uh, kingdom, whatever it is, is all functioning only because of the hand of God, right? Satan is only functioning because God is letting him, right? So we know that because he's the first one of creation, everything is in subjection to him. But we also have hope that because he's the firstborn of the dead, that now we can resurrect from our old ways. You know, we don't have to have stinking thinking anymore. We don't have to go back to our sin anymore. We don't have to be weak anymore because he was the firstborn of the dead, meaning there's resurrection and there's revival, now we can access that same resurrection and revival that God gave us through him being resurrected from the cross and being resurrected from the dead. So revival, what does it mean? It means recovery of breath, right? So by Jesus being the firstborn of the dead, that means he brought revival, right? So those dry bones that were once dead, that were once crusty in that ground, God can now breathe on it and it will come back to life. Just like Ezekiel, right? What happened? He breathed on those dry bones. He asked God to breathe on those dry bones and it said that they came back to life, right? It grew flesh. It had breath in its body. All the parts came together and it became a living uh, being again. And that's how it can be for us. You know, I truly believe that we are going to walk in that time with God, that there are going to be dead bodies and we can lay hands on them. And not only lay hands on them, even Jesus didn't even lay hands on Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And I believe that we will have that same, we, not we will, I declare we have that same power. Because the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world and greater work shall you do, right? And that's the thing. And I, I, I read something. It was funny. Uh, I read Tony Evans said something one time that I laughed about. He said he had to call Lazarus by name because if he said, come forth, he said every dead body would have awakened. That's how much power Jesus had in him. But he had to call Lazarus by name because if he would have said, come forth, every dead, can you imagine that? Jesus saying, come forth and every dead body just awakened. I got so much joy to just talk about this. And it's like, that's, I truly believe that's the power we have and we possess that we can say, come forth. Nick, you can say, dad, come forth in Jesus name. And he will come forth. All of you, Kelly, you can command your parents to come forth in Jesus name. That's the power that you have in you. You know, all of you that have family members or friends that you're waiting to be saved. Niasha, your father, you know, you can say, dad come forth and th that's why i said people only look at the literal um the literal meaning of the word there's so much deeper meaning that all, all these things that are physical are also spiritual and you can call these things that are not as though they are amen and i believe that when you, we're gonna that's because jesus is the firstborn of the dead and has resurrection power and is the resurrection and that's what lives within us. We have the firstborn of the dead living within us. So because he is the resurrection and the life, we have that resurrecting power within us, 
right? And I truly believe that we are going to call dead bodies forward one day, you know? So um, just to end with this is that when, when we come into the realization that God has the priority of the trajectory of this life, we're not going to allow Satan anymore to tell us that this is our end, right? A lot of times we feel like we can't get out of an addiction or we can't get out of a situation and we, we, we give up basically and say, well, I guess this is how it's going to end. I guess I'm going to struggle with this forever. I guess that family member is never going to get saved. And what happens is, is that we are giving Satan too much credit when God says he's the firstborn of creation. So that means that everything is subjected into, into his power. So whatever situation you're going through, it's not going to get the best of you because there is power that is greater in control than what you're going through right now. So I want you guys to just remember that all power on this earth is in subjection to God's power because not only he's the first born of creation, but he's also the firstborn of the dead. Amen. All right, I'm going to end the recording.